Happy Sabbath, church. I just want to welcome our visitor from our pastoral staff. We just want to thank you for being here with us. And don't forget, um, even our visitors, um, at the end of our service, <clears throat> we have back-to-school uh, stuff that you can go downstairs and you will be blessed. Amen? Amen? I woke up this morning and um, I looked to the right side of me and um, there was a lady in my bed. And um, Tuesday of this week, God's Spirit Life, 25 years, married to me. <laughs> no. um, I hope that I can get up 25 years more, and 25 years more, and 25 years more with the same lady in my bed. So where's Sister Brown? Sister Brown, um, not my lo love of Sister Brown, but Sister Brown the deaconess. There's no chance for you. Where is she? That's, that's my friend. She's outside. It was 1992 in Los Angeles when a group of churches came together to do something about the growing problem of teenage HIV. But the solution was unconventional. They got together and sponsored what they called Condom Sunday. The young people got a surprise as they entered the sanctuary that day, along with the handshake and the church bulletin, each one received a condom as a gift from the church. When one of the pastors was interviewed and asked why did the church take this step, he gave this answer. He said, the young people are going to have sex, don't matter what we say, we might as well help them do it safely. It is a startling commentary of the state of sexuality in our society. Aside from the tacit endorsement by the church of teenage sex outside of marriage, there is also an assumption at the foundation of that action by the churches that is even more disturbing. It is the church capitulating to the power of sin, giving credence to the notion that sexual abstinence is an unrealistic expectation even for Christians. It is also tantamount to say that God is unfair in his requirement and therefore unjust. We will not be surprised to find such attitude outside of the church since the predominant ideology of the culture appears to be that sex desire is a need that must be acted on and that self-indulgence is natural while self-restraint is unnatural, even harmful. That regular sexual activities is healthy for consenting adults, married or single, and that sex can be practiced even with multiple partners without risk, without consequence, as so long as you use a condom. There are 1.7 million students in Canada, colleges and universities 
and most of them, young people, at a critical point in their adult development, yet 40% admit to having casual sex at least once, slept with someone they had no prior relationship with. Another 10% admit that they have done so at least six times, and with men, the percentage is even higher. All of this makes sense if we are just animals, subject to our drive. But if we are beings made in the image of God and redeemed by the blood of Jesus, then this pattern of behavior represent a deadly dysfunction in our society. This is an emergency, and it's called for sober and prayerful attention. We all need sexual healing. Now, now you're going to be quiet. Now, today, we begin a three-part series, and I want to start with two clarifying points. And these points apply to this Sabbath and the Sabbaths I am scheduled to speak from this pulpit on this topic. The first one is this. This week is Youth Week of Prayer. But this message is not just for young people. So please, No one come to me afterwards and congratulate me for setting the young people in their places. The dysfunction of sexuality in our our society touch all levels and all ages. And I'm not just talking about adultery and fornication. I'm talking about pornography, masturbation, impure thoughts, and impure language. We all need sexual healing. One more thing. As we approach this subject, I am aware and have indication, both subtle and open, about the danger of making people feel guilty on this topic. And I understand the concern. The dysfunction of sexuality in our society is so pervasive, it touches almost every person, everybody, including from the pulpit to the door. There is a cause to be afraid of being made feel guilty. I know that it's a high value in our society. We think that free people, adults, have the right to be made comfortable. But I don't agree with that. And I don't think it's biblical. In fact, I believe that guilt can be healthy, and I think that the best place to feel guilty is in the house of God. You know why? You know why? Because here is the place you can do something about it. So, expect to feel uncomfortable. But if you leave here uncomfortable, it's your fault. Because the solution to guilt is repentance. And repentance is available to everybody. Today we're talking about the elephant in the room. Let's pray. Father, we invite your presence. Remove any ideas, biblical or non-biblical, that we may have that is contrary to your word and allow us to see Jesus in all his forgiveness. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start with Genesis chapter 1. Sorry, Genesis chapter 30, Genesis 39, chapter 1, and I'm reading 6a. And I want you to read responsive with me today. You could do that? Yeah. 
Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelite who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prosper and he live in the house of his Egyptian master. Come, stop, stop. We're not reading together. Let me start again. Please go take back the slides for me. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, from the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the house of the um, Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. When Joseph arrived in Egypt, as a slave, he had no idea what the future would hold for him. His life had been turned completely upside down at the age of 17. He would not be going to the senior prom. He would not be graduating with his friends. He would not be visiting university or applying for scholarship. The life he had had been taken from him the day the Ishmaelites carried him off in chain was the worst day of his life. It broke his heart to learn just how much his brothers hate him. He pleaded with them not to go through with it, calling them by their names, but they steeled their hearts against him, and, and they all turned away, and Joseph was tempted to think that God has forsaken him too. The crucial moment came in the desert on the journey to Egypt. Joseph had time to think during that journey. And during that journey, he remembered the lesson he had been taught at his father's house. From a child, he had been taught to love and fear God. And now all these family worship start to come back to his mind, including the stories his father told him when he was a young man about his experience with God, like the story of him fleeing his brother Esau, of the story of him wrestling with the angel all night, of the story of the ladder that reached to heaven and all the way back. It all came back to Joseph's mind. And Joseph made a vow, as his father had made before him, to give himself fully to the Lord. Amen. He stopped feeling sorry for himself and placed his life in the hands of the, of the keeper of Israel. He asked God to be his God in exile and to help him to be faithful. Joseph consecrated himself to God, and as he entered the service of Potiphar, 
Determined to be faithful. The Bible says he quickly distinguished himself until he became the head of his master's house. Things are now turning in his favor. But the greatest test is yet to come. The defining moment of his young life, and as it would turn out, it, would, it is going to be a test of sexuality. Genesis 39, verse 6 to 10. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of him, of Joseph, and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withhold nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. I want us to notice in the detail of the story how everything comprised to the disadvantage of Joseph to keep his promise to God. First of all, he's a teenager at the height of his sexual power with hormones raging through his body and an alluring, attractive woman appealing to him. Nature was against him. Second, he's a slave in, the, in, in, in a foreign land. He knows not the language nor the people. He has no right of his own. He is a victim. Surely, he is due to some comfort and indulgence. Circumstances are against him. Thirdly, he does not approach her. She approaches him. And she comes to, at him repeatedly. He is under her roof. She is his boss's wife. Surely, God would understand. And finally, no one has to know. No one will even find out secretly. Secrecy. Joseph has good excuses to break his vow, better than the ones we give to ourselves. But with all that is against him, he takes a principled stand. The Bible says not only does he refuse to go to bed with her, he refused to even be around her. He does not say to himself, maybe I can touch her and let her touch me and still technically be a virgin. It wouldn't come. Joseph takes a principal stand. Look again at his reasoning. Genesis 39, 8 to 9, our scripture. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Then listen to this. How then can I do such wicked thing and sin against God? Now I want to talk to you about the character of this young man. The characteristics that enable him to hold on to his faith, follow his conviction, and keep his vow even though he was under these circumstances. And the first thing I want us to notice is the characteristic of integrity. Joseph had personal integrity. And that word is defined 
as a form of adher adher adherence to a code of principle, a moral principle, a realistic value, or incorruptible ability, incorruptible, or anything um, bribed or morally corrupted. That's one way of thinking. And as a Hebrew youth, Joseph had been trained to live by moral code to guard his virginity. As a matter of principle, Moses' law contains warning against adultery and sexual impurity, and Joseph had been taught these law. But so often, we find legal restraint is inadequate to keep us. And so, even more meaningful is another definition of integrity that derived from the Latin root of the word. It's built on the word integer. It means having the quality of being undivided. An integer is a whole number, and Joseph, like a whole number, was undivided. The same at all times. In whatever company he was in, in whatever circumstances he was, when he was with people and when he was alone, Joseph was undivided. This is the deeper meaning of the word integrity. He could not be one way with Potiphar and another way with Potiphar's wife. There was no point of division in him that separated him from his circumstance and that would allow him to do something to another person. And even though he was in a foreign land, you know, a foreign land, you leave the Caribbean, you come here, and you get your apartment, and you want to be by yourself, and you want to open two doors. Even though Joseph was in a foreign land, where the moral standards were different from his, he kept his vow because he was a whole number. He was undivided. Joseph was an integer. He did not let his circumstances determine his course of action. There's a very interesting trans translation of Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 in the message paraphrase Bible. This verse, this, this is the verses that would um, say, that say, do not be conformed to this world, be, but being transformed. Here how it is read in the message Bible. Paraphrase. It's not a Bible, it's a paraphrase. Are you with me? But I like the reading. Hear what it reads. It says, don't become so well adjust to your culture that you fit in into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on who? God, you will be changed from the inside out, readily recognizing what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to the level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, deploys well-formed maturity in you. You know, one of the things that I always hear from all of us who come from the Caribbean, this is Canada. And so I kind of get in that answer so often. So I decided to go on the map, the world, you know, the big world globe map? And I'm looking for Canada somewhere outside of Earth. But I can't find it. So the standard you had at home, you come here, and suddenly you are in Canada. God bless you. You go stay in Canada if you don't change. Sexuality is a crucial issue to the Christian character. One reason is because sex lends itself to covert activities under the bushes, in the car, behind closed doors, under cover. But it is our private moments that reveal our true character. A person who would not steal with the light on, 
is shown to be a thief in the black hole. It is the deception of secrecy that our covert action doesn't count because nobody sees. But the truth is very different. Our on, 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 on cover activities count all the more because they are more attentive. They are not done for an audience to see or to gain applause. Therefore, they reflect more accurately any of our public act. The true nature of the inner life, our relationship with God, who alone sees all our covert activities, including the one we think we're hiding from God. If you want something to seriously pray about, before you go to sleep at night, examine at the end of the day the things you did in secret. The private viewing, the hidden motive, the sideway glances, the whisper conversation, and then strive in your life for integrity the same way all the time. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 3. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. duplicity. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. You know, years ago, from the White House, we saw from this country what played out on the world scene. What happened to the, even the most powerful man when we do not hold our integrity? If President Clinton had been the same person in the dark as he was in the light, he would have never have engaged in secret theories with Monica Lewinsky. Integrity, the same at all time. That's something to pray about. Matthew chapter 5, 27 to 28, Jesus talking. Jesus is the reinterpretation of the law. Talks about the spirit behind the seven commandments in, in these verses. Let me just read it for you. I want to take you somewhere. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that any man that look at a woman lustfully has already commit with her in his heart. If you want to pray about something, pray about integrity. Apply it in your life. Now, I want to talk about chastity. Chastity. Purity of thought and action. Purity of conduct and intention. That's both inward and outward. It's an inside-out word. Chastity comes from within and would not be corrupted by anything from outside. It was not the fear of discovery that made Joseph refuse his master's wife. It was something deeper than that. He had pure intent. Joseph was chaste. Chaste means pure thought and action. Purity is greater than virginity. We may be celibate, but still have impure thoughts. We can preserve our virginity, technical, and still engage in immoral thoughts and immoral deeds. The commandment of God is more than a list of rules. Each command expresses a divine principle. The command is a statement of the world's violation of that principle. And the principle behind the seventh commandment is not virginity. The principle is purity. 
Do you know what is the most erotic organ of the body? It's the brain. We can be alone with no one else around and project ourselves just by the thoughts of our mind. But our minds belong to God. And when our thoughts are stayed on Jesus, we will live for God's glory no matter what. So when you come to me and then, well, now you come to me. Well, you talk about, Pastor, I can't do this. You know what your thought was? On sex. That's why you have a problem. Well, you were born to have sex. No, yes, you were born to have sex for what? When you married. And by the way, by the way, let me say this to you as Christian. The biggest problem we have in this world is sex, you know. Everything is sex. And so we are afraid to address it in church. No, I'm not afraid to talk to you about sex. That's where our thought is. But if our thought is on Jesus and doing God's will and stop going around the place finding this man, and by the way, stop doing the foolishness. Oh, pastor, no man is in the church. Okay, okay. You right, no man is in the church. All right. So I'm going to go and get a man outside the church. Okay. I marry him. I get pregnant. And so when the church wants to take some action, you're upset with the church. And by the way, you don't get a man neither. Because he's not in church with you. You don't get the man neither. And you want to know why the church behaves the way the church behaves? And the people in the church always have some concern, some problem. Your problem is not with the church. Your problem is with yourself and Jesus. That's your problem. And by the way, by the way, let me just talk to us who are from the Caribbean and probably most of you here. Let me just say this to you. You know as well as I know that when you get pregnant out of wedlock, you have some sort of shame, you know? You, 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 don't, want, you don't even want to come out of the house. Today, nobody care nothing. Nobody care nothing. And if you say something, they're upset. Well, go catch a fish and eat it. No shame. And not to me or to the church, but to God. My aunt tell me a story. She was working, got pregnant out of wedlock. Can't go to work and let the boss know. You know what she did? They used to tie. So the baby can't show. And every time the boss coming wrong, she's trying to do something else. And when she get the baby, she send the baby away for somebody else to mind the baby. Because people had some kind of shame. Today, and that's why every baby I dedicate, I'm talking to you. I don't care who you are, church member or not. Especially if you're married. So, we see the importance of integrity, a life undivided. We see the importance of chastity, which is an inward life of purity inside out. But now... I want to talk to you about another kind of integrity. The integrity of personal relationship, which alone facilitates the experience that God wants us to have. When Mrs. Potiphar proposed to Joseph, it did not translate in his mind something to glow about. Or something that he could rationalize. It was deep and personal with him. And it was not just between himself and this woman. First and foremost, it was personal between himself and God. 
When she propositioned him, his reaction was, how can I do this to God? Instead of trying to justify himself, Joseph justified God. Acknowledging that Mrs. Potiphar was God's property. And if he commits sin with her, it would be an offense to God. You see, that's how we have to think about what we're doing. Joseph never, are you hear what I just said to you? Joseph never viewed himself or others in isolation. And, as, and though he, we belong to ourselves, he saw each person as connected to God and precious in God's sight. Here is a secret of dynamic living as a sexual Christian. A Christian with sexuality, all too often we reduce our sexual behavior to a set of rules, a legal arrangement by which we order our life, and we all know how legal arrangements are. We can always find a loophole. Sometimes believers live their life entirely based on loophole, trying to get by living as close to the world as possible. But when God is living and is a personal God to us, we don't settle for anything least. We strive to be entirely for God. And we don't turn people into sex objects, even though they have done so to themselves. We respect them as God's children, even though they have done so to themselves. All of our relationships are triangular with God at the apex. God is involved in every one of them because every person you know belongs to God. They try to say in the sacralizing of the gospel that there must have been something going on between Jesus and Mary, who had been a harlot. They misconstrued the relationship based on their carnal assumption. They say Mary loved Jesus so, so much and that they were both single. They had to be up to something. And they tried to turn our Lord into a sinner. You know, we would say almost anything to justify ourselves. We would even make God a liar. They misconstrued the gospel. They sacralized it. Do you know why Mary was so devoted to Jesus? It did have to do with something with sex. You know why? Do you know why Mary was the last one to leave the cross at Calvary? She was the only one who thought of anointing Jesus for his death. The last one to leave the cross at Calvary and the first one to reach the tomb on Sunday morning. You know why? Because Jesus was the first man who has ever, who she has ever met who did not treat her like a sex object. Even though she was an harlot. He did not look down on her and he did not lust after her. He respected her like a daughter of God. And his forgiveness and respect enable her to respect herself again, to feel like a person worthy of God's love. No wonder she loved him so much. Because Jesus treated her 
like a daughter of God that she was. If we, hear me now, would have that same consciousness, triangular relationship, all our relationship triangular, we would never treat people like less than they are. And that would keep our sexuality to ourselves too. Okay, pastor. So I had all these sex and undo all these things. What's going to happen now? Well, we virginity. How to get your virginity back? What's going on? Pastor, you're a therapy or what? How to get back your virginity. Let me read the text first. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 30. He that covet his sin shall what? Never prosper. But whosoever confess and forsake them shall have mercy. Amen. Getting back where God wants us to be sexually. The place we should never have left. And by the way, by the way, by the way, let me clear this up for you. Virginity is not a word in the female gender. Virginity is a word for both male and female. Amen. Hello? Amen. Especially when we are single. Amen. Now I want to talk to you about getting back that virginity. Back to where it was. And this is no kind of whitewash in which we gloss over the past without truly facing them. And if what I say make you uncomfortable in church today, and it is, it is because we have to face our true selves before we can get right. We have to face it because God's word is true. Amen. Psalms 51, 1 to 4, and 7 to 12. You will recall that this is a passage that gives the account of David's prayer after his sexual sin when he sinned with Bathsheba and also murder her husband. David poured out his heart to God. I want to read verses 1 to 4. David said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before. No dodging, no dodging. David is saying, God, I know. David said, I know my sins. Then verse 4, he said, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are proved right when you speak and justify when you just. Here's the important part. Underline this on your Bible. Verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop. That Hebrew word for cleanse means unsin me. Unsin me, Lord. And do it with hyssop. That plant there, you saw, they used to put it in the blood. And it's like a sponge. Are you listening to me? It was like a sponge. It soaked up all the blood. David said, I want you to unsin me with that blood. Lots of blood. Unsin me, Lord. And do it with hyssop. 
cleanse me with hyssop. That, that was a plant the priests used. And that was a plant, by the way, when they were coming out of Egypt, when God asked them to take the blood and mark the post, that was the plant they used. Are you listening to me? Cleanse me with Isop, unsin me, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the joy of gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. That's the conviction. Let the bones you, the, the, the guilt. God brings that conviction to us. He is the one that crushes us down with guilt because he wants us to repent. So David said, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide me from your sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Come on. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. There is nothing God can do for you and me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Why could God say that David is a man of my own heart? After this, you know. I'm talking about after this. So don't tell me God can't take you where you were before. This is God's word. God cannot lie. You come in and sometimes talk to you, oh, bang, God. No, 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 no. You don't do what God asks you to. That's the problem. That's the answer. On, on sin me and do it with Esau. By the way, next week, we have communion. You want to be clean? You want to make right back with God? After today, you better come next week. You think, you know why, you know why people don't know God? It's because of you and me. Because we don't believe God is powerful. So that's why, there's the reason why the church didn't have a man. Because you want a man. Did God tell you give me your man? Did you ever ask him? And those of you who married, oh, pastor, I want a divorce. Did God tell you to divorce your husband and your wife? Did you talk to God? You come stand up here and tell God everything till death do you part. The man and dead and you, listen to me, you better stop. This is the answer. The answer is in Jesus. We have to look to him only. The only one who can bring cleansing. Don't look to the world to, for justification. Only look to Jesus. Let's start right here. And accept God's evaluation of my sexuality. My sex life belongs to him. You know, something... Um, I have it for my next sermon, but I'm going to do, because I have two more on the same topic. I'm going, I'm going to read something to you. That's for all of you who, hear what Ellen White talks about in Adventist Home, page 160. I think it's 160. She said, hear what she said. 
She said the marriage chamber where husband and wife comes together, she said, holy angel preside in the marriage chamber as the husband and wife engage in an holy act ordained of God. So here you have the married woman and man, and you have holy angels because they are married. So what you have over here, when you're not married, and you're having sex. What angels you have here? That's why they're so rude. You ever talk to some young people when they're having sex? Well, you don't want me to talk? They're rude. Soon as they're feeling up, feeling up, they get big, they want to talk to you anyhow you want. It's not happening in my house. Soon as they start to have sex, because guess what? Guess who is presiding over their sex heart? The devil. Amen. Can't talk to them when they start having sex. Because it's not holy. It's not holy. Revirgination is a command to consecrate to God from this day forward all of our intimate expression of my sexuality, both inward and outward. No sex without God. Not even sexual thoughts. And I know you turn on the TV and you listen to, and that's why most of you behave the way you behave. Just got to be honest with you. You listen to all these songs talking about women and how this is happening, and guess what happened to you? You might not want to do nothing, but you're in an environment, but because your thought is all, and this is why, not at this church, at another church. She get pregnant. She come, all right, doing all the things and stuff. Um, are you going to marry him? No, Pastor, me not married him. Why you had sex with him? What time it is? If I am not comfortable to do it in the presence of God, I am not going to do it. If I'm a single Christian, it means that I would keep my sexuality for God until he put me with a person he had chosen for me. He has, you know what I just said? He has chosen for me or until Jesus comes. Whichever comes first. If I am married, if I'm a married person, it means I will keep my sexuality for God by being faithful to my spouse, both inward and outward, as my unique sexual party until death or until Jesus returns, whichever comes first. Love you. But well, guess what? God said, if I don't tell you, your sin's going to be on my shoulder. And this, this little shoulder too small. Elder can't even, elder, me want elder to rest your head here. Too small. It is a commitment to God, a vow like Joseph made a vow. And one thing we know for sure, it is something we can never do on our own, but Jesus will help us. 
He will restore our sexual integrity and our sense of self-worth. All to Jesus, I surrender. As I was doing this, I just want to talk to you one more on one more thing. Hebrews chapter 8, 7 to 12. And, and, and this is one of the greatest things of Jesus, or what Jesus was trying to teach his disciple and teach the children of Israel and just teaches us too, is this. And he, he wants them, he wants to take them away from the technical part of the law. Because they were only with keeping laws and, 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 and bringing hundreds and hundreds of lambs spilling blood all over Jerusalem. No change of heart. Jesus was trying to teach him as he does today that there must be an inward commitment that would then affect the outward life. You have to do something. So he introduced what is to be known as the new covenant. A new covenant, not based on regulation. So, so look at it, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. Listen to me very carefully, church. Love you. Hear what Jesus is saying. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been made, been sought for another. Got to listen very carefully. But God found fault with the people. Who did God find fault with? The people. And said, so another covenant was called for. Here is it. Verse 9. It will not be like the covenant I made with your forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declared the Lord. This is the new covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declared the Lord. I will put my laws in their, with everybody, minds. And write on their hearts. I will what? Be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest. This is it now. This is it. For I will what? Forgive their wickedness. And I will remember their sins no more. No more. Oh, I want God to do that for me. That's what I need. Somebody that would forgive me of my sin and remember them no more. And then come in and not only give me a covering, but give me a cleansing. Unsin me so that the guilt is taken away. Don't walk around with no guilt. Give it to God. Not walking around all the time regretting the mistake of the past I made in my old life. I can get rid of my guilt because God has forgiven me from the inside out. That's the word of God. So, you're committing with me now. Could you put a commitment on the board for me? This is for the singles. Single Christian. I want you to read that with me. Say, I would keep my... No, man, you can't read better than that. You can't read better than that. Let's start over. I will keep my sexual act for God until he puts me with he has chosen for me or until Jesus comes again whichever comes first married Christian this is for me and my beloved pastor this is for us and all those who married inside we're going to read 
I will keep my sexuality for God by being faithful to my spouse, both inward and outward, as my unique sexual partner until death or until Jesus return, whichever comes for us. I'm going to pray. You see the blood? Invite you next week, all of you, come next week, give it over to God, and let the blood of Jesus cleanse you. Stand with me, stand with me. Let's pray, let's pray. Father, we understand that you are indeed a good God. We know, we are aware, oh Father, that you want us to be right in your sight. And so Father, you also want us to have a triangular relationship one with you, and one with man, and one with ourselves. And that's why your first commandment says we must love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Father, today, Joseph, our example, is chastity, is integrity, is chaste. We talk about it today. And we know you kept him. And we know you can keep us also. And so, Father, we want you to do what you did for David. So that we, you can create within us a clean heart and renew a right spirit. And, Father, let us hear the words that we, your children, are children of your own heart. Forgive us where we have wronged you. And help us, oh Father God, to be in the world, but not of the world. Help everything we do bring honor and glory to your name. Remove those numbers from our phone that need not to be there. Remove us from those conversations, those houses that we need not to be in. And help us. Help us, Father, as we go through this life. Help us to be faithful to you. We thank you so much for the forgiveness of sin. We thank you for Jesus. And because of him, if Jesus comes into our heart, we know, oh Father God, we can keep your statues and your law. And so we invite him today to reside in our heart. Let the spirit have his dominion over the flesh so that we can be ambassadors for you and live for Jesus. Bless us, continue to guide, and we thank you for all you have done because we've asked all these things. In Jesus' name we do pray. Let everyone say amen. God bless.